But yes, very, very glad y'all are here. To a certain point where you call the mercy rule and just say we're we're going home. <laughs> but I hope y'all are doing well. Hope you're uh, staying nice and and co cool in this hot weather. Uh, let me turn. It is, it is hot out there for sure. Uh, let, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the day that you have made. We thank you for uh, just uh, your church and uh, just being an entity that you have created to, to care for each other and to be here with each other and really speak into the lives of each other and uh, to really pursue uh, not just others with the gospel, but to pursue worship of you. And we ask that you would uh, be with us this evening as we uh, discuss some things that are you know, highly debated, and we just pray that you would give us just uh, clarity, wisdom, discernment, and uh, a good discussion. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So as we started to get into last week, uh, you know, chapter 32, we're starting to get towards the, we're, we're starting to wrap it all up. Uh, the, the last things, eschatology. And we started asking the questions, what is the millennium? When does it occur? And will Christians go through the great tribulation? These three questions are what Grudem presents in this chapter. And he, he starts by talking about amillennialism and postmillennialism, which is, you know, the millennium is this period in Revelation 20 that describes a thousand years where uh, Christ will reign as king. And it, it all comes from Revelation 20. And you go, okay, what, do, what does that look like? When is that going to be? And some people sit and say, well... Is Christ going to come before the thousand years? You know, after the thousand years? Has the thousand years already happened? And basically, when you look at how things are going to play out, uh, it is often presented as, well, this is all about a timing issue. But as Grudem was going through it, he says it actually goes more into an interpretation issue of uh, Revelation 20, because it's not so much of when you think things are going to happen, but how you are really looking at the entire passage and saying it's not just that it's going to unfold this way, but you're actually some, like when you get to amillennialism, it's kind of used, going a little fast and loose with the way that the passage uh, uses metaphors. You, you take it allegorically and say, well, this is not being extremely literal. It's maybe talking about something uh, kind of like it. And so when you get to uh, amillennialism and postmillennialism, basically when you look at the passage, it doesn't, you know, Grudem says it doesn't necessarily uh, hold up under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, which is why the you know, premillennial view has become the predominant one in recent history. Uh, the way that he left off with the conclusion of last week is the millennium that postmillennials hold to is very different than what premillennials talk about because they do not envisage a millennium consisting of a renewed earth or glorified saints with Christ present in bodily form to reign. So it becomes more of a heavenly reign instead of an earthly reign. Jesus isn't really putting his feet on earth and, and reigning here. 
he's reigning up there. So what happens down here just kind of gets to go whichever way. But as Grudem is wont to do, he's setting up amillennialism and postmillennialism because what he really wants to get to is this, what we are discussing tonight, premillennialism. that period of a thousand years in the book of Revelation. Premillennialism. Pre just before 1,000 years. So it sounds like a big word. Really isn't. This is the map he gives us from the book. I think it's very, very beneficial. So classic premillennialism. Christ comes before the millennium. A catching up of believers to be with Christ. So uh, this would be the rapture. And the church age ends here at the moment that we are caught up with Christ. And immediately he comes down to earth. The millennium starts. The resurrection of believers, you know, after the millennium, a thousand years, the resurrection of unbelievers to judgment and believers into eternity, into the eternal state. And so in this, the, the rapture and the millennium happen, boom, boom. Uh, the sequence of events is that Christ comes back before the millennium. The present church age continues until a time of great tribulation and suffering on the earth. After the time of tribulation, Christ will return to earth to establish a millennial kingdom. At that time, believers who have died and resurrected will be resurrected and reign with Christ on earth for a thousand years. If you have not died previous to this point, you're not necessarily part of this resurrected reign. You're just here. Many, but not all, unbelievers on the earth will turn to Christ and be saved. So people will see Christ reigning and they will turn to him. Satan will be bound and cast into the pit so that he will have no influence on the earth during this time period. The emphasis here on no influence. And so it's instead of a reduced influence like with postmillennialism, it is no influence. At the end of a thousand years, Satan will be loosed and join forces with unbelievers still on the earth to battle against Christ, but will ultimately be defeated. Then Christ shall raise unbelievers throughout history to stand in judgment, and after this, believers will enter into eternity. Grudem's quote, it seems that premillennialism has tended to increase in popularity as the church has experienced persecution and suffering and evil has increased on the earth. Now I want to say when they have these views, they're not 100%. Sometimes you will find that somebody will have one of these views and you know it will be tailor-made so they'll believe maybe you know 90% of it, but have a few emendations here and there and say, okay, well, so it's not, 100%, this is, we're, we're very much in a loose area of doctrine. So Grudem then goes into primary arguments for premillennialism, just as a, as a whole. Several Old Testament passages fit neither the present age nor the eternal state. Some point to a future stage in redemption far greater than the present church age, but still without the removal of all sin, rebellion, and death from the earth. And so when you look at these passages in particular, they're very much ambiguous. There, there's a little bit of gray area there, and you go, well, what is happening here? When you go to Isaiah 65, verse 20, which is right at the very end of the book of Isaiah. It says, No longer will there be in it 
the world, an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build another inhabit. They will not plant and eat another. As the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will wear out for the work of their hands. So it's, he's describing a time of really renewal. There will be I mean, when you get to the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. That's a time of blessing. It's, you're, you have long life. And so what he is saying here is that this is a future stage where we're not, we're not in the current age where, you know, people aren't, not everybody is living to 100 and having a great, wonderful life. But at the same time, there's still death. There's great blessing, but there's still death in the land. There's, you know, all sin, rebellion, and death has not been removed from the earth. So you're blessed, but not ultimately glorified, is what he is saying. And, and several of these other passages here have very similar bents to them. Like even when you get to Revelation 2:27. We're very much in you know, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the church is so giving the in indication of Christ's reign that there will be vessels of the potter broken to pieces but Again, there are also other New Testament passages other than Revelation 20 that suggest a future millennium. Nothing speaks as explicitly to it, but they suggest it. Like what we just read out of Revelation uh, you know, 2, 26, that was part of it. You go over to uh, Revelation 12, 5 and 6. Which, I mean, I think he's using that one a little bit loosely because it's really talking about <laughs> the gospel. I would actually go to 1915, I think is going to be much better. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fear, with the fierce rat, wrath of God, the Almighty, and of his robe and his thigh, he has a name written, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So Christ is reigning with a scepter in hand. Several statements in Revelation 20 are best understood as referring to a future earthly reign. And so this is the argument that he's really making is instead of taking it allegorically or even metaphorically, we read Revelation 20 and it seems to be something that is happening right here on earth. It is an earthly reign of Christ. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him. 
so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has had a part in the first resurrection. Over this, these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And of course, after that, it says that after a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released and we start up that final battle. So when you read that, you have several statements in there that seem to be very tangible, not tangential, not tangential, tangible, that's the word I was looking for. So the binding and imprisonment of Satan in the bottomless pit, it implies a far greater restriction of his activity than anything we presently know. And so when you look at things like postmillennialism that's saying that, okay, there's going to be a redu reduction of it. They're saying, well, this isn't just a reduction. This seems that he's not going to really be able to do anything while Christ is reigning. You know, it's, it's a far greater restriction. This is not something, or even amillennialism, this is not something we've seen looking back in history where you can say the devil is not out prowling around like a roaring lion. You get to the statement, those who were faithful and came to life, well... That word came to life when you look at it in verse 4. It is literally the same form used in Revelation 2.8 about Jesus as the one who died and came to life. It is a resurrection term. And so when it is a resurrection term, pretty much everywhere it comes up, why would you then change the formula here? If you see it at the beginning of Revelation, why would you now at the end of Revelation say, well, that's not what it means? So... I'm saying you're actually kind of trying to do a little bit of, you know, theological backflips to, to try to say that that is not physical resurrection. Well, when it says this is the first resurrection, came to life is right next to it, two resurrection terms back to back, same, same issue, contextually. You, you look at it and it, it seems to be talking about actual resurrection, not just spiritual resurrection. Again, reigning with Christ, something that is still future, uh, not something currently occurring now, right? Are we reigning with Christ? I mean, he, he's with us through the Holy Spirit, but when you look at the consistency of the rest of the New Testament where we are told that believers will reign with Christ and be given authority to reign over the earth, um, you know, post-millennialism takes this as reigning with Christ, the authority that Jesus gave to the disciples is going to be what is moving forward. The power of the gospel is the authority and reigning with him. They're taking it a little more loosely. It's not wrong. Uh, but when we go to like Luke 19, uh, 17 through 19, it says, and he said to him, well done, good good slave because you have been faithful in a very little thing you are to be given authority over ten cities the second came saying to him also your, your mina master has made five minas and he said to him you are to be over five cities and I, do I have the right oh well it's I think I'm off there. I, 
think that is actually meant to be I think that's actually meant to be 18 but Yeah. I'm sorry, y'all. My brain is a little a bit taxed today. Uh. <laughs> okay. I can't remember exactly what he's going after there. Uh, right. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm tracking with you. The rewards of, of reigning with Christ. And so it's do we see the rewards given to us now? Thank you. Thanks for getting me back on track. <laughs> First Corinthians six three. Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more matters of this life? And so the argument he's saying there, are we currently judging angels? Are we are we there yet that we have been put in this position? to reign with Christ and be judges next to him. So he says that we're, there, there's very real tangible things that come with this that premillennialism says there's going to be an earthly reign of Christ. He's physically going to be with us on this planet. And uh, scripture seems to, to back that up. Those who come to life and reign with Christ did not worship the beast or receive his mark. That's from Revelation 24. During a time of severe persecution, Revelation 13, 1 through 18, a very severe time of persecution, if the beast has not yet come on the scene, surely this persecution is still also future. Uh, so we're still waiting for some things to happen. And so we're kind of putting the cart before the horse if we're you know looking at postmillennialism and amillennialism but then you get to this other category of that is still premillennialism but it's called pre-tribulational premillennialism or sometimes called dispensational premillennialism, which are just fancy ways of, uh, this is usually called the dispensational view. If you hear somebody called a dispensationalist, basically what that means is they believe that God still has a specific plan for the nation of Israel separate from the church. That's what dispensationalism uh, is mostly about that's what somebody is really trying to, to get after. But we can see that it is a premillennial view that Christ will return before the millennium, but he is also going to come before the great tribulation. So instead of having to go through it, Christ is going to come back now. This specifically means that it is adding in another return of Christ before his return to reign on earth in the millennium. So this is uh, more or less uh, what is referred to as the rapture, that Christ is going to come back and take believers and then he is going to disappear and then come back at a later date to reign in the millennium. 
the present church age will continue until suddenly and unexpectedly and secretly Christ will return partway to earth, call believers to himself. This is primarily taken from the passage of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. I do want to take you there and read that. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort not one another with these words. And then Christ returns to heaven with the believers who have been removed from the earth. There will be a great tribulation on the earth for a period of seven years. Seven being the number of perfection. During the seven-year tribulation, many signs predicted the precedes Christ's return will be fulfilled. So this is a time for all the rest of the prophecies to become fulfilled. At the end of the tribulation, Christ comes back with his saints to reign on earth for 1,000 years. This is the millennial reign. And at the end of 1,000 years, the final defeat of Satan and his forces, the resurrection of unbelievers, the last judgment. After this, believers enter into eternity. It's pretty much the same after that point uh, as... Uh, classical premillennialism. So they just, you know, insert the rapture in there and say Christ is going to come before the tribulation, not after it. Now, note, you can't see this because it's blurry, but this view is found almost exclusively among dispensationalists who wish to maintain a clear distinction between the church and Israel. So, what Grudem is trying to say is that this is actually more of an exception than a rule. He's saying that it is found outside of that, but this is mostly what dispensationalists, when they say that uh, God still has a separate plan for the nation of Israel, he's not done with them, there are prophecies concerning them in scripture, and he's not talking about the church at that point. There is a two-tiered system of salvation. So instead of doing away with, you know, the law, it is still a viable option. He just added Christianity. And so the way that he has this map kind of viewing this Christ comes before the millennium, the believers are caught up and resurrected, and then he, after a period of seven years of tribulation, he comes down, and then the millennium starts. Then resurrection of unbelievers, and then eternity. This is judgment. I'm a visual learner, if you couldn't tell. I like maps like this. So then he moves on, and this is where Grudem says, I'm going to make my case for classical premillennialism. Uh, that's where he falls with a few emendations. He, he's, he's got a few differences. Now, something I have here that I actually meant to get up there, but this is a quote from him in the book, and I want to read this to you because I think it is really truly something, I say this with most doctrines, but especially this one. He says, it is important to realize that the interpretation of the details of prophetic passages regarding future events is often a complex and difficult task involving many variable factors. Therefore, the degree of certainty that attaches to our conclusions in this area will be less than many other doctrines. 
even though it is important that Christians examine the scriptural data and attempt to reach convictions on what the Bible teaches about the millennium, I also think it's important for us to recognize that this area of study is complex and to extend a large measure of grace to others who hold different views regarding the millennium and the tribulation period. So he says, this is all in the future. This is not worth fighting and bickering about because it is very complex. It is very unclear in a lot of ways. And so with all things, grace, grace, grace with each other. Uh, and so he, he really gives us a word of warning before we proceed. And then he, of course, proceeds to say, that he really favors classical premillennialism. Why? Well, while only one passage teaches the future earthly millennium, and he says explicitly, Revelation 20 is talking about this explicitly. A bunch of other passages, you know, trend that way and lend towards it, but this one, explicit, you know, is explicit about it. It should be said that the Bible only needs to say something once in order for it to be true, and this that it means to be something we believe. That is true. If the Bible says it once, it is true. Now, what did I say last week? I also said one verse in all of Scripture is a very difficult thing to build an entire doctrine off of. And you need to be very careful about it. It doesn't mean it's not true, but it means that we should, be, we should you know, approach it with caution because Scripture interprets Scripture. You always want to be able to find other scriptures that, you know, not so you can build a case and say, ha, 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 I found, I found a way to twist scripture to what I want it to say, because this is what I want it, to, want it to say, but that we should really approach the Bible and say, what does it say, and maybe I need to really consider a few different viewpoints that this is what it is really trying to teach me because this appears this way, but I go to this scripture over here, and this one, and this one, and it seems that it's actually saying this. We want to conform to the Bible. We don't want it to conform to us. And so, one passage is true, but our interpretation of it might not be. And we need to have grace with other people, and even grace with ourselves, and humility when we approach these things. Nevertheless, Revelation, it's the New Testament book that most explicitly teaches about things yet to come, things in the future. So it's appropriate that when we are talking about things in the future that it's going to pop up right here <laughs> in this book and only this book because it's talking about the future. This is why we have it. It's so that we have it. And so he says, it's put at this point in the Bible because this is where it came up, effectively. There's no need to put it in Genesis, or Leviticus for that matter. The amillennial interpretation of Revelation 21 through 6 has significant difficulties. You don't say. What is it? He says, well, the binding of Satan in Revelation 20 seems to be mere, more than just a mere binding or restriction of activity. It is the imagery of throwing Satan into a pit, shutting it, sealing it over. You're, you're not just tying him up. You're throwing him in the closet and, you know, locking the door. It's, this is very much uh, a, a big thing in, in verse 2 and 3. He bound him for a thousand years, threw him in the abyss, shut it, and sealed it over him. He's used concrete, right? <laughs> but then you add into that that the description of Satan's activity in 1 Peter 5, 8, what? He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So if he is bound and thrown into a pit that is sealed, he's no longer prowling around looking for someone to devour. And so these two descriptions, uh, 
you know, don't give us just this metaphor of, well, you know, he is at a lesser degree of interaction with the world. It says the word resurrection never elsewhere means going to heaven or going into the presence of God. It's not a, uh, you know, metaphorical thing for something else that is happening. It says the word resurrection signifies bodily resurrection. Now, I can tell you the word resurrection, you know, in... Um, you know, in Greek, literally means just to, to rise up, to stand up. And it is used in a few places of metaphorically going up into heaven, but the, the metaphor and the alleg allegories, you know, which metaphors and allegories are not the same thing, but uh, the language that is being used there uh, symbolically is very obvious when it's used in a symbolic manner. Uh, because of the way that Paul uses it. Paul is more of the one who is going to use the word resurrection in a way of, I want to die with Christ and so be resurrected with Christ in his likeness. He's saying, I want to go through the sufferings of Christ to know his, his death and his resurrection so that I can die with him and be resurrected with him it's if I suffer with him, if I die like him under persecution, then I am assured that just like him, then I am secured the exact same promise of resurrection. So it's, that means that he will be going to heaven. <laughs> so he's doing a play on words there. But elsewhere we find it, when we see Jesus talking about it, it's literal resurrection. So... I'm hoping I didn't just confuse you all there. But the point here being it is bodily resurrection. And when you get to this term in Revelation 20 that says, this is the first resurrection, well, naturally you go, well, that means there's going to be a second one. Well, if there's a second one, what does that mean? It means that traditionally this has taken that uh, judgment. You have a first resurrection that is you are you know, brought back into this plane and then you go through judgment, which is either going to be a second resurrection or a second death. You're either going to be given eternal life or eternal death in that judgment. And that would be the second resurrection. So, of course, the implication that the rest of the dead are condemned to that eternal punishment. So, well, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Postmillennial position that the Great Commission leads us to expect the power of the gospel to result in a largely Christian world that the, the idea that the gospel is just going to go forth from the Great Commission with such power that the world is going to mo largely become mostly Christian, says, well, is, it doesn't necessarily imply Christ is going to use that authority to bring about the conversion of the majority of the population of the world. It says, it's going to go forth with power. You are inferring that the world will become Christian from looking at the result but it doesn't necessarily give us the result in the passage of the Great Commission. It's a, it gives us the command. This is what you are to do. It doesn't say this is, you know, the end of, of what it's going to happen. So they're saying they're, you're, you're kind of inferring something from silence. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that is what Christ is doing. Okay. On that same vein, worldwide Christianization. I like that word, Christianization, the way he pretty much made that up, but I'm going to steal it because I think that's, I like it. Christianization is not based on any specific evidence in the Great Commission or in other texts that talk about Christ's authority and power in the present age. He's right. Scripture nowhere really says that the entire world is going to become Christianized or Christian. In fact, most things kind of tend to tell us the opposite. 
the parable of the mustard seed, which is, you know, what post-millennial, you know, post-millennialism used that specifically last week. The parable of the mustard seed and other similar parables tell us the kingdom of God will gradually grow from very small to very large. It doesn't tell us the extent, that's meant to be a T, to which the kingdom will grow. So saying that post-millennialists will use the passage of the parable of the mustard seed to say this is how the gospel is supposed to grow from a very tiny thing into a big tree. That means that the entire world is going to be a big tree of Christianity. This is not necessarily. It's a parable. <laughs> Several New Testament passages give us explicit denial of the post-millennial position. Wow. Strong statement, Grudem. But when you go to Matthew 7, we'll just briefly look at these. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So from that passage... It tells us that in the grand scheme of things, there's going to be very few Christians. There's going to be a lot of people, unfortunately, just destined for hell. Yikes. That'll light a fire under you, right? Hopefully. If it doesn't, then uh, we should all be concerned. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. That's in there. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness and spiritual, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Yikes. Let's get down to verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So, he even says there's going to be imposters, people who say they're Christian, but they aren't. I mean, God forbid, pastors who say they're saved, but aren't. Yikes. Second Timothy 4, we're just, you know, right there. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, being sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And then he ends it by going back to Matthew 24. So we don't become too reliant upon 2 Timothy, right? 24.15 Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things who are in his, in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant and in those... To those who are nursing babies in those days, pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, and then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, so if they say to you, Behold, he is in, will in the wilderness, 
do not go out, or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Well, actually, we're going to keep going. Then immediately after the tribulation in those days, the sun will be darkened, the sun will not give, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So there's something very interesting about that passage. Well, we're going to get there, but it says immediately after the tribulation, then Christ will gather them from the four winds. So he's saying that ultimately these passages indicate Christ could return soon, any moment. So be ready. And so this has to be considered a significant argument against postmillennialism because they're just saying he's just going to, it's going to gradually grow into the millennium. And this is, he could come at any moment. You need to be ready. And so ultimately he says this is not persuasive because uh, of the long period required for the establishment of the millennium on earth. So let's talk about the tribulation, the great tribulation. This phrase, this this naming of it, comes from Matthew 24. There will be a great distress, great tribulation, unequaled. Um, We just read it. What this means is really ultimately that it's going to be bad. (laughs) It's going to be really bad, lots of suffering and distress. The question, this is what is dividing people. Will Christ return before or after this great tribulation? Are Christians going to have to endure it or not? So, before, this is what is known as the rapture. If you've heard people talk about the rapture, this is what they are talking about. Uh, Christ coming before the tribulation to get his people. So the entire period of tribulation will be a time of outpouring of God's wrath on all the earth. And so it is appropriate that Christians don't be there while God is pouring out his wrath because we are his children. You look at Revelation 3.10, Jesus says he will keep us from the hour of trial which is coming on the whole world. So the idea there is that the church will be taken out of the world before that time comes. He says so. So logically, if Christ returns after the tribulation and defeats all his enemies, then where will the unbelievers come from who are necessary to populate the millennial kingdom? If this is, you know, what scripture is saying in Revelation, that there are going to be unbelievers at the millennial kingdom that are eventually going to rise up and Satan becomes unbound and his armies come against and attack Christ, where do they come from? Well, the pre-tribulation position holds that if thousands of Jewish believers who have become Christians during the tribulation go into the millennial kingdom in non-glorified bodies, ultimately he's saying it gets, gets a little twisted here, but after the tribulation of Christ comes and defeats all his enemies, You have one final battle to come still to to get rid of Satan. Well, this is saying that you're still going to have a lot of Jewish people who are going to become saved. Man, it gets... I don't know if I'm conveying that well. Use my cheat sheet right here. Mm. 
Yeah, if Christ returns after the tribulation and defeats all his enemies, where will the unbelievers come who are necessary to populate the millennial kingdom? That's pretty much written verbatim. He doesn't help me out at all. <laughs> but ultimately... His point is that this view makes it possible to believe that Christ could come at any moment and yet many signs have to be fulfilled and that the Jewish people are going to be the secondary fulfillment of this. Yeah. Well, he, and the argument he is making there is that in order to have a millennial reign, he would have to make his enemies a footstool under his feet. Well, Otherwise, it's not a reign, it's a millennial submission. I understand. He will reign. He will be judging the earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, de it depends on what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Where do we see that? Can you show me where we see that in scripture? That's, so that's the argument is we want to be very biblical here and it gets very, very confusing like this. You know, I'll be absolutely honest that uh, that right there, I do not understand what he's talking about there. He, he kind of, so this goes back to, I believe, the post-millennial argument. And so he's trying to use this as a polemic. He's trying to use this as an argument. But it's, you have to kind of follow his train of thought. And if you don't know his train of thought at that moment, you know, he, he lost me is what I'm saying. And, and so I've been, you know, going back trying to find it. And so I apologize that I don't, don't have that for you. Um, but it's, the, the argument here is trying to say, we want to go back to scripture as much as possible. And who knows? Uh, it is very unclear about what the millennial reign looks like and what, it, like practically. It just says it's going to happen and the Christ is going to reign on earth and that Satan's gonna be bound. And so we are left to kind of infer and guess as to what that looks like. And that's why it creates a lot of confusion and disagreement and that's why we're in the midst of all of this.
It's full of a lot of symbolism. That is true. Revelation is full of a lot of symbolism. It's also full of uh, a lot of things that look like they could be very much verbatim. <laughs> you know, true. Yeah. And so it's the, the task we have that makes this very difficult is we don't know what is symbolism and what is not symbolism. We don't know exactly, you know, like when I sit there and I read the previous chapters where it talks about Christ, you know, being in heaven with the angels in the, earth, in the heavenly throne room, I take that as verbatim. That there's going to be a scene unfolding in heaven in the heavenly throne room, but right, right. It it's. And, and you're reminding us, you know, very much that at the heart of this, most of this is just speculation. The Gospels have given us everything we need for salvation. So I'm not going to say the book of Revelation doesn't have value. It has a lot of value. But it's, we don't need to be so caught up and concerned with it that we take our eye off of the, the main ball, which is... You have salvation in Christ. And the Gospels, you know, Jesus talked about the tribulation. He talked about the end times. He talked about these things. And so when you get to the book of Revelation and you look at it and you go, what, what Jesus is saying and what they're saying here, whatever matches up, you go, okay, this is, I don't necessarily have to know how it all works. I just need to be ready that it's coming that seems to at least to me to be the the main goal is it will be wrapped up be ready for his coming And, and I'll be brutally honest with you here, um, especially in seminary and, and things like that, when we got to this part of systematic theology and going through it, uh, I may not be the right person to teach this to you, this section, because I, I take you know what might be a very extreme view of God's going to wrap it up in his own way I don't see this as something I really need to put all my eggs in. He's going to do what he's going to do. And as long as I take the commands out of it, the commands of this is what you need to do, and do them, and take the warning on its face, I don't, need, I, I don't really care about arguing <laughs> what it's, what it's going to do. And so it's, and so, I mean, I might not be the person to really get into that, yeah. Okay, they, they will reign with him. Is that, am I reading that right? So, so the idea that maybe with this, that if he comes and takes the believers out, they get their heavenly body. They're in the heavenly body. They're, they're in heaven, but he comes and reigns on earth. And he brings them back with him because it says mm -hmm. we'll be in the kingdom with non-glorified bodies. So that means there's got to be people in there with glorified bodies. 
Right. So that would be believers that hadn't died with believers that died and came back in their glorified body. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I think what he is giving at is what we're talking about is the time of great tribulation, which if we go back to, where is it? The picture, it's all the way back here, is, um, so the, the tribulation is happening right here. And that's what you're not part of. That's what you're not part of, is there's this seven years of great tribulation. And it's a... And so they're saying this is the time that he's going to keep you from. And so that's where the resurrection would be specifically to keep believers from going through that time of great tribulation. And then he would come back with the believers for the millennium. And then he would take care of Satan once and for all in the final battle and then resurrection of unbelievers and believers to judgment. That's what he's saying. He says those Christians that come out of the tribulation are not going to be the believers here. They're going to be the Jewish population. This is dispensational. It's going to be the Jewish population that comes to know Christ. That's the dispensational belief. Right. Uh, he's just trying to make a point there that uh, there is if you're going to take the viewpoint of Romans and uh, the other dispensationalist view that God still has a plan for Israel, he's going to say that's the fulfillment of that prophecy. So, yeah, there will, there will no doubt be Gentiles and other people saved at that time, according to this view. All right. I think it's clear as mud, at least to me, um, sorry, but we'll, we'll, we'll continue on and get confused later. So he says, pre-tribulationists -pre would then view the teachings of Matthew 24 and the warnings and encouragements given to believers as applying to Jewish believers, not to the church generally, which is how it is given that the church is the new Israel. And therefore, whenever it meant, whenever Paul mentions Israel, Truly, he's talking about us. And if he's not, he's specific about it. Response to pre-tribulation. So, Grudem says, it's inconsistent with New Testament descriptions of the tribulation to say all suffering that occurs is specifically a result of the wrath of God. So he says, the tribula you, know, you still have sin in the world. You still have the effects of the fall. And so, as a result of that, not everything is the wrath of God. Some of it is just the result of living in a sinful world. So even if the devil gets bound up, you still have your own sinful desires that are going to come after you. And so, wickedness is going to be multiplied on the earth. Persecution of the church and satanic oppression are greatly increased. Well, the tribulation is... You know, Satan's not bound up. So it kind of says that Satan's going to have a lot of activity right before he gets bound up. He gets a big push. All Christians will avoid the wrath of God, but they will not necessarily avoid all suffering and hardship. You're still in a broken world. Is the fact that Jesus tells faithful believers in the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3 that he will keep them from the hour of trial of coming on the whole world is not strong enough evidence to say the entire church will be taken out of the world before tribulation. He was speaking to a specific church. So he says you're kind of taking it a little far by applying it to everybody. The hour of trial come, which is coming on the whole world doesn't need to necessarily refer to the great tribulation. It could be just a great time of suffering and persecution. It could have been, you know, narrow in the first century. It, it could have been any number of historical persecutions. 
the promise that the church in Philadelphia will be guarded does not imply that they will necessarily be taken out of the world, just that they will be faithful and guarded from suffering and testing. So the, he's saying that you kind of go a little far by saying, okay, the Lord's going to protect them, but somehow we have taken that to, well, he's going to just remove them entirely. Mm. Yeah, he says that he doesn't say he's going to remove them entirely. They're taking another passage over here and this passage and kind of marrying them. He says, it is no argument for the pre-tribulational view to say that there must be some people in non-glorified bodies who will enter the millennium. Because when Christ comes at the end of the tribulation, he will defeat all the forces arrayed against him. That does not mean he will kill or annihilate them. So, you know, he might take captives. Who knows? Many may surrender without trusting Christ. During the period of the millennium, many will also be converted to Christ and become believers. The pre-tribulational view is not the only one consistent with ideas that Christ could come back at any time. There are signs that precede his return. So, I don't like the way that sentence is structured. Basically, the idea that there are signs that have to precede his return that need to be finished before, you know, like scripturally, prophetically, so that he can return. And he's saying this view doesn't mean, is not the only view consistent with the idea that he can come back at any time, even though there's still some things that need to happen. While unlikely it is possible the signs have already been fulfilled. We talked a little about that last week. The desire to preserve a distinction between the church and Israel is not supported by the New Testament and does not supply a need to see a distinction between these two groups at the time of the tribulation. It's the dispensational view. Um, some people hold it because when you read scripture, it seems that, you know, God and, you know, is holding out hope, holding out a role for future Israel, especially when you look at Old Testament and you look at Paul holding out hope that his Jewish brethren will come to belief in Romans. But when you go back and you read another work of Paul's, Galatians, and several of his other works, he very much says that the law was never, ever able to, to bring forth salvation. That the Jewish people who are saved are saved under the same type of faith that Abraham has. The promise of Abraham, not the promise of the law, the promise of Abraham. And he says that is what we have in Christ now is we have the promise of Abraham that it is credited to us as righteousness because we have faith in Christ. So he's ultimately saying that Jesus even though Abraham didn't necessarily know Jesus and all of the whole plan of salvation, he was putting faith in Christ by putting faith in the Lord and in his plan. And ultimately, God has always had one plan of salvation. He has had one plan in different phases. And so the dispensational view necessarily means that you are saying that God has two plans. Two ways to heaven, not one. And so ultimately, there are people that would sit there and say dispensationalists are heretics because they're saying that there is another way other than Christ to salvation when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I wouldn't necessarily be that harsh, but maybe they've got something there. <laughs> After, so after the tribulation, what are the arguments for Christ coming after the tribulation, which means that Christianity would go through the tribulation with no rapture? Well, the arguments that Grudem has here that the New Testament nowhere clearly says the church will be taken out of the world before the tribulation. He's right. It's not explicit. When you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, 
which is the, uh, the main passage for supporting the rapture. Says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, caught up with him in the air. But then Grudem brings up the idea that the context of 416 describes this not as a secret event, but a public and open event. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. So he says this is a big, loud trumpeting of Christ's return, an announcement, the rolling out of the red carpet for the king. And he comes, and the dead in Christ rise and meet him in the air. So it says the, the term caught up, which is the word rapture, which the word rapture comes from Latin, from the Latin Vulgate. So it is not found in Greek or Hebrew. Uh, it, is, it is a Catholic term. Um, so the idea of the rapture, um, just honestly from a scholarly standpoint, is not really something that holds a lot of water. It is a term that comes out of an obscure reference through a, a, a translation that was not necessarily, uh, it was translated into a word that really just means caught up. And so really the ones that are caught up are the ones that are already dead in Christ. Yeah, raptured. Now, not necessarily for instance, who's coming today, it would be us because we're still living. Well, it, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. So it has kind of the implication of they rise and then we meet them. Uh, so and they don't say it. It, it's not explicit. <laughs> you're, kind of <laughs> you, you, yeah, you're, you're getting into a bunch of, like the scholars will sit, really sit here and split a bunch of hairs. Uh, I'm trying to somewhat walk you through that without a, <laughs> giving, giving you all of the you know, they have debates and fights that will travel, you know, travel hundreds of years here. Um, and so this, this viewpoint that Grudem is describing is that the tribulation is quite clearly linked to the Lord's return in some passages. So you go to Matthew 24, 31, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, and he says, they all mention the trumpet call. And he says, this trumpet call seems to be the same trumpet call. And so what this is saying is you don't have a special coming of the Lord before the tribulation. You have him coming for his millennial reign, rolling out the red carpet. The trumpet happens simultaneously for everybody. Um, and then, of course, they bring up the Jewish people. It is difficult to understand Matthew 24 is referring to Jewish people, say, during the tribulation. And not as the church, we're kind of meant to examine, you know, expect that it is, he is referring to the church there as people saved during the tribulation. First of all, he says, Jesus is addressing his disciples. He's not addressing a Jewish nation or just random people. These are specifically the people he is teaching. The disciples represent the church, not a future kingdom. They were always meant to be the establishment of the church and the, the ones who carry on and propagate the church because it doesn't make any sense that he would talking, be talking about a future plan for the Jewish people if he is only disclosing this to his disciples because they're the church. The evidence, while the New Testament doesn't seem to justify the idea of two separate returns of Christ. He says it's, you you're, you. You know, you, you're, you're building it out of finding, you know, passages and putting them together is what he's saying. This quote, no such view is explicitly taught in any passage. It is simply an inference drawn from differences between various passages that describe Christ's return from different perspectives. 
says it's likely that the church will go through the time of tribulation predicted by Jesus. So we should be prepared to endure suffering. And there's lots of passages that say, hey, endure suffering when you are persecuted. And so that is ultimately where we come to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he brings up these review questions, and it's very much, you know, he mentions, before reading this chapter, did you have any conviction about Christ's return? And it's going to, you know, it's amillennial, postmillennial, or premillennial. And uh, Staines will say if you had a conviction, you know, teaching the other sides kind of does make you bristle a little bit. And that means you have a conviction there. So, anybody have a good conviction? Is anybody convicted that Grudem doesn't know what he's doing? <laughs> And yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. Oh yeah. You, you could spend hours on the on just the the verses alone. So it's. <laughs> Say, I, I don't really have to worry on this if I'm banking on dying before he returns. <laughs> it, yeah. Well, and what Grudem is trying to do, and he, he's not always successful, truly, is... He's trying to take, you know, these hundreds of years, thousands of years of commentary and systematic theology that is out there and take all of the, you know, up here scholarly uh, lingo and <laughs> all of that and distill it and summarize it into something that everybody can understand so that you don't have to be a pastor or a theologian to, you know, interpret this stuff and comb through it that, you know, he's really truly trying to make it accessible to everybody. And sometimes it doesn't translate well. Sometimes you get way too simplistic on complex matters. And sometimes it's just the human failings of He's an imperfect person as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Trust in trust in the Lord. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately, at the end of the day, he's saying this is not something we should ever divide worship over. Feel, feels that way. I mean, look at what the, the church is devastated. Not just here. I mean, it's, it's been devastated. Post tribulational, pre tribulational. I had the professor joke, and I'm, I'm going to butcher the joke, <laughs> but it's uh, something along the lines of. Uh, the, you know, pre-tribulational people are going to be taken after the tribulation because, you know, they're, they're hopeful. You know, or they're cowards. That's what it was. They're cowards. They want to be taken first. So, of course, he's going to, you know, toughen them up by making them endure the tribulation. 
And then the post-tribulational people, they're brave, so he's going to take them first, <laughs> not give them what they want, and then everybody else can't make up their minds, so squarely in the middle. <laughs> he said, that way, just like God, nobody gets what they want. This question number four. How does your present view of the millennium affect your Christian life today? Does it? Well, yeah. Should it? And so it's when we sit there, and, you know, you, you made a joke about it feels like some seals have already opened up. It, it's, well, you go, okay, well, if you're expecting Christ to return before the tribulation, you're supposed to say, all right, be ready at any moment. Are we ready at any moment? Are we cozy in this life that we've got? Because it, it, our viewpoint on this actually does affect kind of how we act. Because if we say, oh, we're going to go through the tribulation, then you're going to be like, well, batting down the hatches, he's not coming for us. <laughs> or... Yeah. He's promised to be with us. That's true. That's true. But this question is interesting because there are people out there that are fearful of the Lord's coming or fearful that, you know, yeah. And so I, I see it when I look at the book of Revelation, that's actually meant to be a comfort to us. Do we read it that way? Yeah, Job's meant to be a comfort to us. Oh. What do you think it will feel like to be living on an earth with a glorified body in which Christ is king over the whole world for a thousand years? No, it is, is that, comes that comes after. That's the final judgment. Yeah, that's actually where we're going next. The new heaven and the new earth. Um, what might be the positive and negative results of a pre-tribulation rapture position in the everyday lives and attitudes of Christians? It's not a small river. Definitely keep your head on a swivel, right? <laughs> so similarly, what might be the positive and negative result of a post-tribulation rapture position that 
will have to actually endure. That's what I got for you. Well, I don't know if I covered it well, but we covered it.